Good evening. Tonight begins a series on one of the most complex topics in the Bible. And so it has to be a series, and that topic being the Godhead, or one might say the Trinity. And I understand that there are those that may feel weird about the word Trinity in the realm of religion, uh, because there are those who say that's not a good word. It's not found in the Bible. But the concept of Trinity all right, is biblical. And so it's a fitting word. But here's the Bible word for God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Paul calls it the Godhead. All right. And this passage, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that's another way of saying that Jesus was fully God. That he was deity and is, I should say, deity. And it's a subject that really divides the realm of Christianity. You, if you think about it, there are so many different churches that teach different things about the Godhead. Take, for example, that some believe that there, there's only one God, and that being the Father, and that the Holy Spirit is not God, and that Jesus is not God. Or there are others who say, well, Jesus and the Father are God. But the Holy Spirit is a power or something other than God. And so it is a very complex subject. And so this is the first lesson of many in this series. And my goal as a Bible teacher, my goal is to try and teach the Godhead in a way you can understand, in a way that is simple to understand. And that's, that's all Bible teaching. If it's not understandable, then there might be something wrong with the teacher or the teaching because the word of God is understandable. Ephesians 3 and verse 4, the apostle Paul said to the Ephesians, Whereby when you read, uh, talking about a letter that he wrote to them, whereby when you read, you may understand my mystery and the knowledge of God. And so, or my knowledge of the mystery of God, I should say. And so one of the best ways that, and this is not original of me, but this is, these slides are my original uh, slides. But one of the best ways to teach on the Godhead is using a triangle. So let's start with the triangle. All right. How many triangles do I have up here? Well, the obvious, right? I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but let's see. There's one triangle uh, showed for us here. And so let's say this triangle represents God. Right, And there is one God. That's the first point to be understood concerning the Godhead. There is only one God. And majority of Christendom, I'm not talking about the church of Christ. I'm saying majority of Christendom will agree with this point. There's one God. As a matter of fact, this seems to be the point that, that, that different religions try to unite, right? Even, even though that, oh, your church is different, my church is different, but we all want worship the one God. That's the point. They agree with this, and we agree with it because it's Bible. There's only one God. Let me share some scriptures 
that emphasize this, all right? Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, part of, of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. How about Malachi 2 and verse 10? And there are many, I'll only show you a few to drive home the point, right? Malachi 2 and verse 10, uh, through the prophet, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Yes, these are questions in a different context, but the truth is stated there. Isn't there one God? All right. You know, the answer to that question is yes. A question for contemplation. How about 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5? 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. How many gods? One. All right. James 2 and verse 19, even the spirits agree with this truth. All right. James 2 and verse 19, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. All right. And so there is one God represented by our triangle. Here's the thing about a triangle. All right. For it to be a triangle, there has to be three points. And that's why it makes it, it, it's the best shape for this teaching. Because here's the next truth about the Godhead, right? There is one God. But here's the next truth about it. There are three personalities. In other words, there are three that make this one God. There is the Father. The word, and I put a slash there, the word and then the son. All right. And we'll, we'll see why, because it's scriptural. And then there's the Holy Spirit. You cannot separate a point from the triangle and say it's a triangle. You cannot separate the personalities of God because he mentioned it in scripture. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1 and verse 26, beginning. The first mention of there's a plurality in personalities. The very word Elohim that is used there. Genesis 1 and verse 26, then God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the face of the earth. God says, let us. We get a, a, an insight to a conversation of the Godhead. Let us make man, Father, Son, and the, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Some people read this passage and assume because of their doctrine, there's only one God and it's only the Father. Because of that line of belief, when I, when I share this passage to those people they, they, and ask them, who is the us there? Here's a huge insertion or here's a huge assumption. Oh, it's God talking to the angels. He already made the angels, so he's talking to the angels. Let us make man in our image. Now, you and I both know that there are other scriptures that don't bear that out to be the case. That you and I are not made in the image of angels. The psalmist said, Lord, what is man? That you are mindful of him. You have made him a little lower. Then the angels, not in their image, a little lower than the angels. All right. Here's another one. Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of, here's the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
again, some people take this verse and say, no, 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 it doesn't say to baptize in the, in, in, in the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's saying to baptize in the name of. So, so disregard the three. We got to find out this name, and that name is Jesus. That's how some people teach it. But that doesn't fall into the context. I believe in baptizing in the name of Jesus. But I also believe in baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This passage is talking about authority. Jesus just said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them by this authority. The authority of the Father, the authority of the Son, the authority of the Holy Spirit. Notice there's three. How about 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 through 6? There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. So you have the spirit. There are, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. So you have Christ, our Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God, the Father, who works all in all. You add to that Ephesians 4. And verse 4 through verse 6, this foundational doctrine of the seven ones. All right, notice there are seven ones. Paul says, for there is one body, the church, one spirit, the Holy Spirit, just as, there were, uh, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, the hope of the Christian is eternal life. It's one. One Lord, that is Jesus, one faith, that is the gospel. One baptism, you read the Bible, there are several baptisms, isn't there? There's fire baptism, there's water baptism, there's Holy Spirit baptism, there's baptism of suffering. Which one, Paul? Make up your mind, Paul. Well, he's talking about the one baptism that saves, water baptism. There's only one baptism. And then he says, there's only one God and Father of all. So mention in this List of seven ones, the Spirit, the Son, or the Lord, and the Father. That's biblical. All right. Now, the next point, and this, this will be the, the first lesson. The next point I want us to dive into now, right? There's one God. The Bible teaches that God is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the challenging part, all right? Maybe you're sitting there, and you might, well, I already know that. Good for you. But here's the challenging part, all right? The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father, all right? Though some teach contrary to that truth they say well well who's the father it's jesus jesus is the father there's a problem with that conclusion there are so many passages where jesus is speaking to the father where jesus says i am not the father i've come to do the will of the father so let's look at it so first of all the son is not the father let's notice this Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and become obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Notice here what Paul said about Jesus. That though Jesus was equal with the Father. All right, so two different uh, personalities mention you. That though he was equal with God, he didn't consider his deity as something to grasp on. But he humbled himself and became different from the Father. Different in the sense that the Father is a spirit. Different in the sense that he took on human flesh. 
And it says that he died on the cross. Did the Father die on the cross? Did the Holy Spirit die on the cross? The Bible says that it's the blood of Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of it. It's the blood of Jesus, the Son. It is the Son that died on the cross. The Son is not the Father. How about John 6, verse 37 and verse 38? This is Jesus, not saying that he's the Father, but referencing that he's here on earth and the Father is in heaven. He says, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. All right, so as he spoke, he's talking about there's one still in heaven who decided to send me here on the earth. The son is not the father. John chapter 1, here's a, or John 17, and then John chapter 1. John 17, verse 1 through 3, notice whom he was praying to. Jesus was not praying to himself. He was praying to the Father. When he taught his disciples, he didn't tell them, you pray to me. He told them, this is how you ought to pray. Our Father. Notice here, he is praying in the context of John 17. The Bible says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given them. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And then he says, and, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The son is not the father. John chapter one, and this is why we put the word or the son, because this is a passage that reveals to us that prior to becoming flesh, there was God, the word. All right. John 1 and verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Who, who is that? He was with the father. He was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. What beginning? Genesis. Let us make man. In our image. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 14. And the word became flesh. Again. The son is not the father. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory. Listen to this. The glory of the only begotten of. The father. You can't be begotten of you, <laughs> All right? You are begotten of someone else. You only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Son is not the Father. Yes, the Father is God. The Son is God. But the Bible makes the distinction. There are three personalities, three different. All God. All right. Now let's notice the father is not the son. All right. We, we need that because it's scriptural. All right. The, fun, the, the son is not the father. The father is not the son. It goes both ways. So picture in our triangle that there are, um, that there are uh, uh, arrows pointing both ways from, from the father to the son. Arrows between the, the, the word is not. It goes both ways. Son is not the father. The father is not the son. Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17. Here we have Jesus on earth during his baptism. What happened there? 
Matthew 3 and verse 16 and 17, when he had been baptized, Jesus came immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit. There's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God descending like a dove alighting unto him. And suddenly a voice from heaven saying, I wonder who was that? All right. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. God didn't say, this is me. <laughs> but let me tell you, church, what inspired this study this evening is a Bible study that me and William are engaged in. And I pray for that. But it reminded me, I need to teach a lesson on the Godhead. Because I feel so bad sitting across from, from, from you know, these gentlemen, very, very kind gentlemen, and just to watch them explain away the scriptures instead of believing what it says. The father is not the son. This is the father speaking about his son. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. How about Matthew 17 and verse 5? This is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus. And there appeared with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Peter being Peter, Lord, let me build some tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And the Bible, and we pick up our, our reading from there, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The father is not the son. How about Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2? Talk about, you know, pointing out two individuals in the same place, right? Could, could we do that? Oh, absolutely could we do that, right? If me and Titus went to the same place, let's say we went to McDonald's, and one of you saw us. Oh, I saw Titus and Lima at McDonald's. You can, you can see us in the same place. There's two of us, and we're not the same. Well, how about, how about this picture? Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before, uh, before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down, here's the place, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, let me ask the church, where is Jesus in this image? Is he on the left side of the throne of God? No, it says at the right side of the throne of God. The, the, the right side throughout the scriptures teaches a, a position of authority and of power. But notice this. Who's sitting on the throne? If Jesus is at the right side of the throne of God, who is sitting on it? The Father. Right? You talk about identifying two individuals, two different individuals in the same location. Father and Son right there on the throne. How about the golden text of the Bible? John 3 and verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, in his son, should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Notice that. The father, John even says this in, in his book of, of, of 1 John, behold what manner the father, the manner of love, the father has bestowed upon. The father so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we come back, Lord willing, and the next first Sunday evening of the month, we will talk about, we, we will talk about other scriptures that point out there's one God. This is the order. I'm giving it to you. We're going to talk about there's one God. Then we're going to talk about how there's three personalities. And then the next lesson would be the Son is not the Holy Spirit. We're going to take our time and study deeply what the Word has to say about this. Maybe you're here this evening. I want to ask you this question. Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? Because that's why He sent Him into the world. To die for our sins. And if you're sitting there this evening and you say in your heart, I know that Jesus is the Son of God. That you believe He's the Son of God. Then here's what you need to do. You need to repent of all your sins. Luke 13 and verse 3, I tell you, no, except you repent, you will likewise perish. You need to confess Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And whoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my, before my Father who is in heaven. You need to be baptized into Christ. The only way you get inside the body of Christ is baptism. For as many of us have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27. And then you need to be faithful. Luke 9, and verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone desires to follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow after me. If you need to obey the gospel this evening, this invitation is for you. If you need strength in prayer, let us know what we can pray for and we can pray with you. Whatever that need may be, make it known as we stand and sing the song.